I first dropped acid when I was 18. I was over at these people's house one night. This guy I went to school with was over there and asked me if I wanted to try some acid. I had read about it in the newspapers and heard a few friends talk about it, so I was curious. I was pretty jacked up on marijuana, so I decided to try it, and I dropped it. I don't know what I was waiting for, a flash or, or a rush or whatever, but I kept sitting there waiting and waiting and nothing was happening. So I got up and then went to the dresser and put on a pair of pink capris and a green and brown blouse. I thought the colors were beautiful. So we tripped down to Market Street and I decided to buy a hot dog. I was very hungry and I had put mustard and ketchup and relish in the usual and I put the hot dog up to my mouth and somebody started screaming. I didn't know what was happening, so I looked up at my friend Terry and said, Did you hear that? Didn't you hear someone scream? He said, No. I got the hot dog up to my mouth again, and I was ready to bite, and the scream got louder. And it hit me. No, it couldn't be. And I looked down at the hot dog, and there was a face on him. Eyes, nose, a mouth. I had put the ketchup to where it looked like his hair. And he started telling me that I couldn't eat him. That he had a wife and seven kids at home to support. And I stood there with this hot dog and asked Terry, do you know this hot dog is talking to me? And he says, nah, let's get out of here. He thought I was just faking. And I told him, look at the thing, he's got a face and he's screaming. And the guy finally looked over, and he got on the same trip that I was on. And we sat there carrying on a conversation with that hot dog. Finally, I decided I was just hallucinating, so I put it in my mouth and bit down. It screamed so loud that you could hear it all over town, so I had to throw it on the ground and step on it. and I was jumping on this hot dog in the middle of Market Street. I realized that I had murdered it. And I took off screaming down the street, scared. In this tribe, the hair was cut in a special style when a boy reached adolescence. Josie, don't bother George. You almost finished with that report, George? Yeah, just about. He's reading about Indian boys, adolescents like him. Why don't you grow up? Grow up? I'm just as grown up as you are, even if you are older. Says who? Mrs. Baker. She said that girls mature about a year earlier than boys. I suppose if she said you were a genius, you'd believe her. Yes, I would. Now, George, I think Josie is right in believing Mrs. Baker. She's a lovely person and a very good teacher. All the kids at school like her. Hey, Dad, here's something for my report. Oh, well, what's that, George? Only the grown people have clothes on. Say, Mom, can I wear this skirt tomorrow? Yes, Josie. 
I've almost finished hemming it. It says here that until they were 12 or 13 years old, the children wore no clothes at all. The wearing of loincloths and skirts was considered a sign of sexual maturity. Well, that's interesting, George. And it ties in with the film Josie was telling us about. Sure does. We saw that film last year. I'm on the preview committee, Dad. I'm going to tell the class what to look for in the film. Well, have you decided what you're going to say? I'm going to tell them that the most important things to look for are the changes that take place in our bodies and feelings when we grow up. Grow up? That is, when we become adolescents. We've used that word adolescent before. Who can tell us what it means? Dorothy? Well, it's boys and girls just beginning to mature. It happens when they're about our age. That's right, Dorothy. Are there any other points from the preview committee? Yes, Mrs. Baker. Warren has a list of questions we'd like to project for the class to see. That's good. Go right ahead, Warren. John, would you put out the front lights, please? When does human growth begin? How much does one grow before birth? Do boys and girls grow at the same rate? What are the main growth changes that occur during childhood and adolescence? The committee did very well. The film we'll see this morning will give the answers to these questions. It will also show the earliest phases of growth as well as the changes that take place during childhood and adolescence. It will help you to understand the way the cycle of human growth is repeated over and over from generation to generation. And now we're ready for the film. Lights. Growth is controlled by tiny organs called glands within our bodies. One of the most important of these is the pituitary gland located in the head. It secretes chemicals into our blood. The chemicals are called hormones and they regulate body growth. The pituitary hormone influences the secretions of other glands, notably the testes and ovaries located in the pelvic region of the body. The testes secrete the male sex hormone and the ovaries the female sex hormone. Presence of these hormones in the blood brings about many changes in the bodies of both boys and girls. And in the way they feel and act too. For boys, hair begins to grow on the face. For both boys and girls, hair grows under the arms, in the pubic region, and elsewhere on the body. The breasts of the girl begin to develop. The vocal cords of both boys and girls get larger and their voices deepen. These physical changes make the boy feel more manly and the girl more womanly. Both feel independent. They begin to be interested in members of the other sex, in social activities, and in being together. These are normal feelings. When a boy is between the ages of 13 and 16, the testes begin to produce sperm cells. These sperm cells are carried through the tubes in a thick colorless liquid called semen and at certain times are expelled through the penis. This happens during mating and sometimes during dreams in sleep. This is a normal function of the body. In addition to the ovaries, the sex organs of the girl consist of the tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. When a girl is between the ages of 12 and 15, 
the ovaries begin to produce ova or egg cells. About once every month an ovum ripens and leaves the ovary moving into the tube. While the ovum moves slowly along the tube, the uterus becomes richly supplied with blood to nourish the egg. But if the ovum doesn't meet a sperm cell, it fails to grow and is discharged. Some days later, the uterus sheds its lining and a little blood passes from the body. The bleeding decreases and in a few days stops completely. This process is called menstruation. The whole cycle begins again with another ovum ripening, usually in the opposite ovary. During early adolescence, the menstrual cycle may be quite irregular. It usually takes a year or two for a rhythm to become established. These functions begin as we attain sexual maturity. But all of us do not mature at the same age. These boys and girls, for example, are all 13 years old. Yet among them we see many differences in size and maturity. These differences and the fact that girls usually mature earlier than boys, both physically and emotionally, sometimes create problems. But by the time boys and girls reach their late teens, these problems will have been solved. Also, by the time they have completed their education, have steady jobs, want to get married, and are ready to accept the responsibility of having and raising children, the differences in sexual maturity will have disappeared. Lights, please. The principles of growth and development we've seen in this film apply to all human beings. Now let's begin our discussion by answering the first question from the preview committee. Who can tell us when human growth begins? Bill? Growth begins when a sperm cell enters an egg cell. Suppose the sperm cell doesn't enter the egg cell. Then the egg isn't fertilized and it dies in a few days. That's correct, Bill. Steve? Do you have a question? Well, it's sort of a silly question, but I was wondering why there are so many sperm cells and only one egg cell. That's a very good question, Steve. Let's use the projector to explain it. Now, in the first place, Remember that the male sperm cells are being produced all the time, while only one egg cell is produced each month. That's one reason there are so many more sperm cells than egg cells. Then see what would happen if there were only one or a few sperm cells. The ovum is produced here and moves into the tube. The sperm cell has to travel all the way up here to find the ovum. And if there weren't ovum meeting a sperm cell, it would be small. Lights, please. Does that answer your question, Steve? Yes, Mrs. Baker. Are there other questions? Julie? About menstruation, is it really normal for the body to bleed like that? Completely normal, Julie. Remember in the animated film, the lining of the uterus became filled with blood with which to nourish the fertilized ovum. Well, when the ovum is not fertilized, there's no need for this nourishment. So the uterus merely sheds its inner lining, and naturally a little blood leaves the body at the same time. Oh, I see. Now for the questions the rest of you have. Carolyn? Do boys have anything like menstruation? I heard my mother tell a neighbor I was born cesarean. What does that mean? Why don't all people have red hair? What happens if more than one sperm cell enters an egg? 
How long will it take till my voice changes? Are girls always bigger than boys at 12 or 13? Why do some kids grow faster than others? All of those are excellent questions. You students who've been watching this film, you've heard the questions we're going to discuss. You can discuss these same questions with your teacher, and you can ask any others you have in mind. Death. Out of the slime and darkness it comes to inflict its life-destroying poison on the careless, the unwary, the unprotected. No sane person would deliberately expose himself to its... No intelligent person would venture with distance of its fangs. Yet to young people are flirting with a poison every bit as deadly as that of the snake. To John, it seems perfectly natural and innocent to bump into an old classmate. He hasn't seen Pete since he dropped out of school last year. From the looks of him, he seems to be doing well on his out-of-town selling job. What John doesn't know is the selling job is pushing dope, and the long absence from town was spent in the state prison. Their accidental meeting calls for a little celebration, and Pete has just the thing. There's a little private party going on tonight, plenty of fun and laughs. Take a break from the books and live a little. It sounds good, but today's his father's day off, and John needs his help with some school problems. If there's another party sometime, maybe he can make it then. But Pete isn't interested in some time, maybe, or squares. If you want to swing, call him. Right now, he's got to split. He's got to find fish ready to be hooked. Victims to supply him with money for the heroin he needs today and tomorrow and tomorrow. Compared to Pete's problems, John's are nothing. Poor grades, expulsion from the team, the frustrations and responsibilities of growing up seem important only to himself. All he needs is a little help, a little guidance, a little understanding. But the help, the guidance, the understanding are not there when he needs it. His parents are away just when he was counting on them to be home. His problems must wait for tomorrow, or he can solve them tonight alone. Only he can go just so far alone. During his childhood, he was loved, helped, protected. Suddenly, that's all gone. Now he's in a man's body, he's expected to be a man, to stand alone on his own two feet. This he will gladly do, but he needs a little push. He needs someone to help him over the hump of schoolwork that's troubling him. Today, he's had it. The studies can wait until tomorrow. He knows he can finish them then, what he doesn't know is behavior habits formed long ago are now taking over. The practice of putting things off, making excuses, shirking unpleasant tasks is strongly etched in his character. It's Saturday night and everyone else is out having fun. It's the best excuse in the world to join the party. party is swinging. Just the thing he needs to pep him up. The stage is set, the principal players are in position, the curtain is up. John doesn't realize it, but he has just been cast as the star fall guy in a real life tragedy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
The excitement of Helen and several beers have taken effect. Inhibition and caution are forgotten. When Helen suggests they have a few more beers, he's all for it. Why not? Everyone else is doing it. To refuse would be square, and that must be avoided at all costs. Besides, he's never been high on it before, and he never will. He can handle the stuff. The only trouble is he can't handle so much. Under the influence of the beer, Helen comes through as much more friendly. He's flattered by her attentions and her interest in him. If he could see her arms, scarred by the needle marks, he would know she's a hype. If he could see her police record, he would know she works for Pete. Pete and Helen know their parts well. They've been through it before, and they know the time is right. Throw out the sucker bait. It's time for the next step. The next step is the garage. There, some of the gang are really blasting. That's where the real action is. Come on and take a look. Take a trip from Squaresville. Live a little and see what it's like for yourself. The senses are dulled just enough to be reckless. Helen, the music, the beer, the promise of excitement press in on him. Now, curiosity has to be satisfied. And why not? It can't do any harm to look. The trippers, the grasshoppers, the hip ones, all gathered in secrecy and flying high as a kite. Outside the boundaries of their phony world of kicks is the ever-present possibility of discovery. This must be avoided at all costs, for discovery brings with it the penalties of society. Shame, arrest, prison. So destroy the evidence, leave not a trace, burn it in paper trash. That way they can deny possessing the illegal marijuana. They can say the flaming can is part of a game. They can lie, they can swear. This time the gang's lucky. It's not the law, or discovery, or problems. It's just their supplier, Pete, with his number one chick, and a new guy looking for kicks. Forget it, man, and get with the countdown. Shake this square world and blast off for Kicksville. To John, his first pot party looks exciting. Everyone seems to be having fun. Best of all, there are no parents, no other adults, no one to interfere with the fun. The feeling of importance, of belonging, of putting one over is taking hold. Pete intends to tighten that hold, to squeeze it, to hook it, to lock it in. Now's the time to introduce the joints. But Pete has learned the rules well. A pusher can never be caught with the stuff on him. Instead, he must leave it, stash it, get it from a flunky. This is the test, the time to separate the man from the boy. John's willpower, individuality, character are slipping down the drain. In their place come the old behavior habits and excuses. Everybody else is doing it. If he can handle bennies and beer, he should be able to handle a few harmless puffs just to see what it's like. 
the natural defenses are crumbling. The barriers of caution are beaten down. Drag it, man. Try anything once. Fly. You can't get a habit from weed. Quit whenever you like. Don't be chicken. Startings of the gang, the effects of the atmosphere and beer, the desire to belong, he chooses to go along. John surrenders his dignity and lays his future on the chopping block. Not whether it's good or bad or right or wrong. But if he stopped to think, he would see the stupidity of it all. Now he's too involved to think. He's having kicks. He's away and flying. Up, up, out of this world. into this room here. She got her sister with her, too. Please, doctor, hurry up. Uh -huh. oh, I stay right here waiting for the good news. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Business all the finish, please. Out to sign. Uh -huh. Tomorrow, everybody come and drink the free wine and for my new bambino. Huh? Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Don't you go to Tommy, she's a boy. He's a boy, no? Yeah, Tommy, it's boring. Maria, my Maria, she's okay. She's all right. Well, uh, the bambino is all right, my Maria is all right, but uh, your face isn't all right. What's the matter? Tony, your son was born dead. Pretty good idea, Tony. But I'll have to ask you a few questions first. Questions? What questions? Well, not now, Tony. I better wait till your wife. Feels no, good. please. And now you've got to be crazy. What's happening? All right. Did anyone ever tell you, Tony, that you've got syphilis? Syphilis? Sure. What are you talking about? No, I never think got it. It's just tough. Take it easy. Think. I want you to think back carefully. Do you remember ever having a sore? It didn't heal very fast. No, 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 I never... Well, yes, about a, two years ago. I'd say before I was married, I got a little sore, but 
But I buy some salve, I put them on and she gets all cured. Well, that might make the sore go away, but no medicine you could buy ever cured syphilis. Well, you've got a syphilis. I'm almost sure syphilis killed your baby, don't you? You see, a syphilitic sore will go away without any treatment in time, but the germs stay in your body. You mean I... Yes, don't you? I'm afraid that you gave Maria syphilis and she gave it to the baby. I break up my Maria's heart. I don't want to live no more. Tony, you've got to get hold of yourself. What's the good of you when no more can have a bambino? You're wrong, Tony. With proper medical treatment, you can both be cured. Then you can have all the bambinos you want. You mean if me and my Maria we go to the hospital, we can have another bambino? Is it going to live? Sure. <laughs> if you have the proper medical treatment. I want you to promise me you're going to come to the hospital. Please, Dr. Excuse me, please. The heart is so full up, he's got to run over a little bit. But is it true that we can have another son who's going to be all right? Believe me, Tony, it is. All right. We take any kind of a treatment, the doctor. Adam, I've got to go in the other room and see your wife again. I can't go with you. No, Tony, but I'll let you know when you can come in. Please, Doc, don't be too long, huh? Okay, Tony. Well, goodbye, Tony. Now, remember, you and your wife must come here every week. You mustn't miss a single treatment. And don't you worry, Doc. Me and my Maria, we come here every week. You bet you my life. Thank you, Mr. Doctor, for coming to see me so many times. Matron and me are very glad. We have such good friends who tell us what to do. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Madroni. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Tony. Goodbye, Doc. And uh, thank you too much. Be sure you come every week. Come in, young man. Oh, Dr. Perkins. Yes? I want to thank you for taking an interest in Tony Madroni and his wife. Oh, don't thank me. The more patients, the better I like it, Dr. Uh... Morton, I was the intern on the Madroni case. Oh, yes, Dr. Morton. I'm very glad to meet you. Won't uh, you come in? Have a chair. Thank you. I won't be long. <clears throat> well, young man, what seems to be your trouble? That's all right. This is Dr. Morton. Well, sir, some time ago, I, I picked up a girl in a dance hall. And... Well, about three weeks later, I noticed a little sore here on my mouth. Didn't pay much attention to it. I thought it was just a cold sore, but the darn thing hung on so long, I got kind of worried about it. I happened to pick up one of these public health service folders and got to reading about syphilis, and I got scared. Hmm. Did the folder explain everything all right? Yes, sir. It said in there that even though a sore might heal up just like mine did, if you've got syphilis, the germs might still be in your body. I found out all the things that could happen to you if you didn't get to it right away. I figured I'd better come down here and find out about it. Good boy. Miss Jones, I want to take a blood test on this man. Yes, doctor. All right, take off your coat and roll up your sleeve, please. Now, this blood test will show whether you had a cold sore or whether you've got syphilis. Now, if this makes you nervous, you can 
Turn your head. Make a tight fist, please. Is it going to hurt much, Doc? No, no. Just a little pinprick. As soon as we finish this, you can go into the other room and Dr. Howard will give you a complete physical examination. What's your name? Jerry Anderson. Jerry Anderson. How did you happen to come into the clinic? Well, I couldn't afford to go to a private doctor. I didn't know what to do. Call the county health department and see if they couldn't do something for me. I was told to come and see you. Hmm. What's your trouble, Jerry? Well, I've, I've got a pretty bad sore down here. Mm -hmm. Just stretch out on the table over there. We'll have a look at you. Come over here. I want you to see this little corkscrew devil that's causing all your trouble. Look. This dark field test shows up the spirochetes. Can you see them wriggling back and forth across the slide? Yes. What did you call them? Spirochetes. Those are the gems that cause your syphilis. You had to learn the hard way that you can't tell by the looks of a woman whether she has syphilis or not. I guess that finishes me. I'll have to leave home, quit school, and go someplace where people don't know who I am. Now, Jerry, you know you can't meet any problem by running away from it. You may not realize it, but you're a very lucky young man because we're catching this in time to cure you. Miss Jones, prepare a four-tenths Neo injection. Yes, but, Doctor, I can't take a chance on the folks or the kids at school finding out I've got syphilis. Now, don't worry about having syphilis. Luckily, after the first few injections, the sore will disappear and you won't be able to infect anybody. You can go about your classwork, play basketball, tennis, or indulge in any other sport. Sit down here, please, and roll up your sleeve. And nobody need ever know that you have syphilis. But you'll have to report every week and not miss a single treatment for at least one year. That's your relief. I feel like living again. Gee, Doctor, that, that didn't hurt a bit. I'd always heard that shots for syphilis were painful. Not if you go to a doctor who knows his business. I don't know how to thank you, Doctor. Well, just come into my office and give me the name of the guy who infected you. That's all the thanks I want. Come on. Doctor, I kind of hate to do that. I'm no stool pigeon. Sit down here, please. Now, Jerry, a lot of men have a false sense of chivalry about giving the name of the woman who infected them. We're not going to do anything harmful to the girl, and your name won't be brought into it. We only want to bring her in for examination and treatment. If we can treat and cure you and the woman responsible for your infection, we're breaking another link in the evil chain of syphilis that stretches every case of the disease. Now look here. We've found that one case of syphilis usually results in three more. Each of the three results in another three. So you can see, Jerry, that every time we treat and cure this disease, we are preventing the spread of syphilis to many hundreds of people. So you're doing your job by coming to me for treatment, and I'll do mine by curing you. Syphilis kills babies. It strikes back with blindness and insanity. A licensed physician with modern methods can cure syphilis. No quack doctor or medicine you buy can do the job. Don't be a sucker. Stick to medical treatment and you can be cured. Prostitutes and pickups aren't safe and cannot be made safe. It doesn't pay to take a chance. Watch for the warning signals. Any sore or rash that does not heal quickly means go to a licensed medical doctor or call your city or county health officer at once. If you think you've been exposed at any time, get a blood test and a physical examination now. No, for sure. <laughs>
returned to barbiturates because grass wasn't having that much effect on me. Me and my friend had been smoking for about two, three years. It wasn't a thing to be identified by anymore. Everybody was using weed. We used to smoke 30, 40 numbers a day. You'd get high, but it just didn't have the same feeling. So I tried reds, barbiturates. I just needed something new. I got them from friends. They were on H, but they always had jars of pills around. It's just like heavy drinking, but a more sluggish feeling. I was dropping Red Devils, Sicano, at first. Later on, I fixed it. Your perception is all out of whack. You can't tell depth perception how close things are to you. I fell asleep in my car driving. I was lucky I was at a red light. I got woke up by a cop. He didn't know I was under. I told him I'd just gotten off work. Another time I was home. I thought I was acting real good when I walked by my mother. I turned the corner and walked right into a wall. I passed out. I woke up in the same place the next morning. Kicking a barbiturate habit is like nothing you've ever kicked. With heroin, you get sick, vomit, can't eat or sleep. With barbiturates, you have all of these and more. You go into convulsions. The strain on your body when you kick reds or yellows is about all you can take. A little. Did you buy the sanitary napkins for me today? Mm-hmm. They're on your bed. Now you just go take a nice bath and you can fix the flowers later. All right, thanks. Hi, Mom. Hi, dear. Did you see that dress at the teen shop? What dress? The one that was pale yellow with flowers across here and a sash in the back. Oh, I know the one. Oh, Mom, could I have it? <laughs> Libby, where would you wear a dress like that? I'm as old as Jean, and she wears clothes like that. Oh, come here, Libby. Jean is more developed than you are, dear. You still have your little girl looks and shape. I know, but we're the same age. But you're two different people. Some girls grow up sooner than others. Some not till they're 15 or 16. I hope I won't have to wait that long. I'm sure you won't, dear. Before you know it, a most important thing will happen. What's that? You'll begin to menstruate. Do you know what that means? It means you can have a baby. That's right. So your body prepares for it. What do you mean? Well, your body makes a warm, soft place out of blood and tissue for a baby to grow. And when there is no baby, the body gets rid of this blood and tissue through the lower part of the body. That's menstruating? Uh-huh. And once it starts, it'll happen every month for a period of a few days. That's why it's sometimes also called the period. I don't know if I'll like it. <laughs> oh, I, Libby, you said you couldn't wait to grow up. I know, but it's kind of scary. Oh, not at all, sweetheart. It's completely natural. It's part of being a girl. I'm sure that once you understand it, you'll see there's nothing scary about it. Come on, let me show you something. Hmm? I know sanitary napkins. Go ahead and open them. I've seen them in my magazines. Well, do you like to learn how to use them? I guess I'd better. All right. You'll need this sanitary belt, too, to hold them in place. It goes around your waist under your panties. 
Then you put the short end of the napkin through the front fastener. And the longer end through the fastener in the back. See? But won't it leak through? No. The napkin absorbs the menstrual flow, so there's nothing to worry about. And Libby, see this blue polyethylene on the bottom and sides? Uh-huh. That's a special moisture-proof shield to prevent accidents. Besides, you should change to a fresh napkin every three or four hours. What do I do with the one I take off? Flush it down? No. You wrap it in toilet tissue or a paper towel and throw it in the wastebasket. But, Mom, suppose it happens at school or someplace where I don't have this. You look in the restroom. If there's not a napkin dispenser there, you ask the nurse or a teacher. Oh, and Libby, I bought you this. It's a special sanitary panty you might want to try instead of the belt. The napkin fits right inside. You might find it more comfortable than the belt. The elastic loops hold the napkin in place. Gee, Mom, they look just like my regular panties. Gee, thanks. Wow, we sure had some important talk. Wow, I'll say we did. Oh, honey, you might want to keep the things in this drawer. Then they'll be handy for whenever you want them. That's a good idea. Hey, you better scoot off to the pool, huh? Yeah, I don't want to be late. Hi, Libby. Hi, Jean. How's the water? Oh, cold. It's okay. <laughs> Guess what? What? Boy, did I have some talk with my mother. What about? Menstruation. Oh, that. What do you mean, oh, that? Nothing. You mean you knew about it before? Sure. How long? About a year. Do you? Do I what? Menstruate. Of course, Billy. How come you never told me? I don't know. I always felt it was kind of personal. And besides, it's nothing special. It happens to every girl. What happens to every girl? Womanhood. Oh, you mean the curse. What do you call it? The curse. You know, being unwell. Why do you call it that? I don't know. Some people do. Hey, come on. Let's go swimming. No. You go. We'll be in later. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, that's an icky word. My yeah. mother called it menstruation. Mine does, too. I guess we're kind of lucky. You mean to learn about it from them? Yeah. But I guess you really don't know what it's like until it happens to you. Yeah. Come on, let's go swimming. Okay. Oh, I'm glad the shopping's finished. It was so crowded in the stores. Guess what, Mom? You're menstruating. How did you know? Oh, I expected it. How do you feel? All right, I guess. You don't seem, oh, quite as bubbly as usual. Are you sure you feel like bowling? I'm all right. Well, you're right, I guess. There's no need to mope around just because you're menstruating. But don't overdo, hmm? Okay, I won't. <laughs> Whenever they could get together, they talked things over. So naturally, Libby told Jean that she was menstruating for the first time. Jean could tell that Libby was feeling uncertain, a little unsure of herself. So she suggested that Libby might rather not bowl. But you know Libby, to her any sport was a challenge.
Today we would discuss what it means to grow up. Well, some of you may already know something about it, but it's important to have a thorough knowledge so you realize there's nothing frightening or embarrassing about leaving childhood and entering young womanhood. You'll understand better if you know something about how you got to be a girl. So let's begin by examining the facts of birth. Now, actually, each of you began life about nine months before you were born as a microscopic living organism, a single cell that resulted from the joining together of two other cells, one from your mother and one from your father. This little cell found a safe shelter in your mother's body, in a soft, blood-rich organ called the uterus. There, it divided into more cells until finally there are millions of tiny cells growing into a baby. And that baby lived in your mother's uterus for about nine months until you were born. Then you grew up into the big girl you are today. Of course, you still have your little girl looks, but not for long. You are approaching adolescence. A gland called the pituitary begins to encourage different parts of your body to turn into that of a woman. Little by little, each one of you growing differently in height, weight, and bone structure. Your breasts will begin to develop, getting rounder and fuller. Your hips will fill out, taking on softer, more womanly contours. And a soft growth of hair will appear under your arms and in the pubic area. Your body will awaken internally, and those organs that make you uniquely a girl will begin to develop too. There are two ovaries, two narrow passageways called the fallopian tubes, and the uterus. And they're all surprisingly small. The uterus, not more than the size of a pear. The ovaries, not more than the size of walnuts. Then there's the vagina, the passage from the uterus to the outside of your body. As you approach your womanhood, these organs begin to function, and your very first menstrual cycle begins. The ovaries release an ovum, a single egg cell which finds its way into one of the fallopian tubes. Very slowly, this little egg cell travels through this tube toward the uterus. But before it gets there, the uterus prepares for it, builds up a special lining of blood and tissue so that this little egg cell can grow into a baby if it were fertilized by a male cell. Now, if the egg is not fertilized, the special lining of blood and tissue is not needed and flows out of the body through the vagina along with the egg itself. This is the menstrual flow, the monthly breaking up of the special lining of the uterus. And when it's over, the whole process begins all over again. Your body prepares to release another egg cell. Your uterus prepares to receive it. And when fertilization does not take place, you menstruate again. The total flow is a rather small amount, lasting rarely less than two days, nor more than six. This total process is called the menstrual cycle and lasts about 28 days. That's why you menstruate about every 28 days. Of course, in the beginning, until your body gets used to it, your periods may not be regular. This is not unusual. But give yourself time to get accustomed to this new experience. And before long, it will seem as natural as all the other days of the month. And let a calendar help you. Use it to keep a monthly record of your periods. There's a calendar for this purpose in the back of this little booklet, Growing Up and liking it. A 
as well as instructions for using it, and lots of other helpful information. Later, I'll give you each a copy before you leave. But now, one thing more I want to discuss. The importance of looking and feeling your best, not only during your menstrual period, but all month long. You may feel free to interrupt and ask questions if you like. Jody, what if your hair needs washing during your period? Wash it, but don't walk around with a wet head. Dry it quickly and thoroughly. Remember, clean hair and skin help prevent blemishes. Nancy, what about bathing? Jean, what do you say to that? You can do it every day. Right. A bath or shower every day, especially when you're menstruating, is certainly very important because you tend to perspire a bit more during that period. So, bathe, use a deodorant, change your underwear every day, and your sanitary napkins often, at least every three or four hours. Mrs. Cooper, what about sports? During your menstrual period, you can do almost anything you're used to doing on other days. If you're used to bicycling, bicycle. If you dance, dance. Just keep as busy and active as always. But just don't overexert till you're tired out, Libby. Is it true that some girls have cramps when they're menstruating? Some girls have them, some girls don't. If you do, don't be alarmed. They pass rather quickly. There's a helpful exercise for easing the cramps in this little booklet I told you about. Mrs. Cooper spies Libby and wonders why she isn't skating. When Libby explains that she has her period, her teacher doesn't think that's a reason for sitting on the sidelines. Libby admits she really doesn't want to miss the fun. Besides, she feels better now that Mrs. Cooper has reassured her. But she remembers how important it is not to overdo and soon finds that she's having fun. She has even forgotten that she was ever angry with Jean and realizes it was a good day in more ways than one. Gee, Mom, I had a good time today. I don't mean just skating. I did when I went bowling, and when Jean made me go, I got mad. But now I'm glad, because she was right. You can have fun while you're menstruating, if you understand what's right for you. <laughs> I think my little girl is growing up. What was that you asked me about? A yellow dress? Libby is beginning to understand her feelings and how to cope with them. Now, growing up is all the fun it ought to be. In fact, if right this minute you asked her how she feels about it, she'd say, it's wonderful being a girl. Officer, open the door. Come to the grass. It's the fuzz. Who got out? What are we gonna do? Flash it. Swall. Man, let's split. Oh, 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 o
Everybody remain seated where you are. Hey, man, are you putting me on and you're not going to say anything I want you to put on this bill? Yeah. Then why is an alcohol made illegal? Flowers and grass. Like two street shit. Hangers and roses and liver. Besides, grass doesn't have it for me like alcohol is. Besides, that cigarettes are much worse than Right, man, that's Don't worry, I can't fight, man. You tell him, you tell him. Hey, quit pushing. Guys, you tell him. Everybody knows that we have an addiction to get us blown as much as you want. And quit any time you want. That's what I have a party about. There's nothing wrong with blowing grass. Yeah. Me, you're not going to use them anyway. Well, speak your mind then. Okay, I will. No one has the right to tell me what I can do with my own body, what I can eat, drink, or smoke. This is a free country, and no one has the right to take away my constitutional right. I think it's terrible that the American people have accepted a law that makes smoking a harmless weed illegal. Marijuana is legal all over the world. There's no question about it. Marijuana is Good, bad, right, wrong. That's not where it's at in this film. Right, wrong, good, bad. Those are things for you to decide. Too many people have already decided for themselves and you whether grass is good or bad. What's most important is what you think. So without any preaching from this film, let's examine the facts and only the facts. There are too many false impressions and prejudices to do it any other way. Okay, then why is an alcohol made illegal? It's a lot worse than grass. Yeah, right. Like take juice freaks, man, they get yeah, hangovers and throws yeah. the liver. Yeah. Besides, yeah. grass is not habit for me like alcohol. Right. The facts are, if you drink enough, alcohol will give you hangovers, cirrhosis of the liver, and what's more, it can even kill you. If you are a certain emotional and psychological type, you may become dependent both physically and emotionally and will join the five to six million known alcoholics in the United States. Now, what are the facts about marijuana? What do doctors and psychiatrists have to say about which is worse for you physically and emotionally, alcohol or marijuana? The facts are, at this time, there are no known damaging physical effects from the use of marijuana. But, unlike alcohol, when you take too much at one time, you don't pass out. You more than likely run the risk of an unpredictable and unpleasant bummer. Occasional drink before dinner by adults, like the occasional use of marijuana, does not necessarily lead to an emotional dependency in the stable, mature personality. Sure, go ahead. Great olives. You like that? I'm sure. glad. Okay, good olives. Well, ah, oh, that's smart. However, teenage is not a time of great maturity and stability for most teenagers. The pressures of school, parents, finding your own identity and self-confidence set you up for a drug dependency that could just as well be alcohol if you preferred that to grass. Some adults are not mature or strong enough to stand the pressures of their daily lives. These adults can become just as emotionally dependent on marijuana as on alcohol, whichever is more socially acceptable and easier to get. 
even when the alcoholic is physically withdrawn from his body's need for alcohol. He always goes back to it until he learns how to handle his problem. Just as the alcohol drinker who finds himself needing a drink more and more frequently is the warning sign of his dependency, so it is with the pothead. The more he needs the escape from reality or the pleasure of marijuana, the more he is becoming emotionally dependent exactly as the square and unhip alcoholic adult does. Do two wrongs ever make one right? Cigarettes are much worse than right, man. Don't worry, I got cancer, right, man. That's right. It's a fact. No one ever got cancer from pot. But it's also a fact that no one ever dropped out of school because they were hung up on tobacco. And no one who just finished smoking a cigarette ever forgot she was driving a car as she tripped out on the beauty of a back road nature trip. Smoke cigarettes and do other things. You wouldn't dare to do this on pot. Or this. Or this. And would you rather your pilot had just finished a joint, not a cigarette? Or your surgeon operating on your heart? Your attorney pleading your case? Your sergeant? Your dentist? Your flight leader? Your team center? Your LSO? Your school bus driver? Your country's astronaut? Or even the guy who is just changing your front tire? Would you rather he was smoking a cigarette or a joint? However, neither your government nor any responsible person recommends smoking. So, two or three wrongs don't make one right either. Everybody knows that we didn't say Jack if you can blow as much as you want. Oh, I'm here. And quit any time you want. Blow as much grass as you like and your body won't need it? Right. You can quit any time you like? Not true for everybody. And that's the problem. The World Health Organization of the United Nations with its leading medical and psychiatric experts from over 100 member nations has this to say about marijuana being habit forming without one dissenting vote. That may be true for the great majority who smoke pot, but it's not true for the many thousands who have gone on to acid, amphetamines, barbiturates, and end up on heroin. However, it is not a fact that practically everyone on grass turns into a flaky drug addict. That's just not true. Every informed person knows this. What is true may be discovered in this narcotics rehabilitation center in some of the group therapy sessions, where we will learn what former drug addicts have to say about marijuana turning them onto hard drugs. Yes. How many of you started on pot before you started heroin? I did. I did too. I did too. I did. So did I. I did. I did. Me too. Me too. I did. I did. So did I. I did. I did. That means all of you have used marijuana then. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was 11 when I first started. I was about 19. I think.
think it's kind of hard to uh, deal uh, marijuana because it's so bulky, you know, and you have to go through the trouble of chopping it up and cleaning it. I think it's much easier to deal heroin, you know, than marijuana. Really? Because, really? uh, you know, all that bulk and everything, it's much easier just to have a small bag of balloon that you can carry and, and you can cut that up and get a lot more money for it. I think it's terrible that the American people have accepted a law that makes smoking a harmless weed illegal. Marijuana is legal all over the world. There's no question about it. Marijuana should be made legal. Now! Now! Make marijuana legal! There's no question about it. Many young people agree with that. Let's examine the facts. First, marijuana is not legal all over the world. It isn't legal in Mexico, Egypt, India, Great Britain, China, Japan, or any of the major nations in the civilized world. Nigeria is one of the latest countries to make marijuana illegal. Here, the pusher is given the death penalty. Though each year, more and more teenagers commit crimes while up on grass, this is not the major problem. However, grass as a factor in crime must not be overlooked, especially in that percentage of unstable and aggressive types, and those who wind up in trouble with the law because of something done while they are high on pot. for the illegality of the sale, possession, or the use of it. So, why not make it legal? Why not bring it out in the open and make it legal in America? It's just that there are too many unstable people in America who would become emotionally dependent on marijuana and end up as non-functioning weed heads. Easy availability and the implied approval of society will, in the opinion of many medical authorities, create a drug dependency problem far more serious than that of the five to six million alcoholics today. If the acknowledged effect of marijuana is much greater than alcohol, it becomes easy to see why the emotionally unstable and immature may turn to marijuana in even greater numbers than to alcohol, and eventually go to more dangerous drugs in the form of LSD, pills, and heroin. Who, me? Who, me? Who, me? Who, me? It's Who, possible. Who, me? And that's the problem. You can never tell who is so stable and so emotionally secure that they will not become dependent on marijuana or other drugs for pleasure and full-time escape. What's the matter? I'm feeling good! Nothing, baby. Nothing. ago, only the criminal and socially deprived blew grass or used heroin. Today, the nicest people may be on grass. Why is that a fact? I took it on a dare. But only kids take dares.
Man, everybody blows pot. But well, everybody does blow pot. I don't want it, man. I don't want it. Take a, take a hit. No, I, I don't want it. I don't want it. No. Take a drag. It won't hurt you. Come on. You got the first sign of character and emotional weakness is when you do things just because others are doing them. When I'm high, it enhances my creativity. This is the same subject matter and painter for both paintings. One was painted before going up on weed and the other while high on weed. Can you see any significant creative difference? When I'm high, it enhances my creativity. The artist thinks he's being more creative, but do you see it in his work? To some extent, the very inhibited person may feel a greater freedom to be creative, but this doesn't mean he will have the necessary talent to be so. It really makes me understand myself. If you don't understand yourself when you're down, then there's no logical or scientifically accepted reason that you will when you're high. Besides, while you're up on grass, you may tell yourself only what you want to know if you are lucky enough not to be on a bad trip and discover a frightening thing about yourself at that time. Let's face it. The reasons we've heard for blowing grass up to now are like an iceberg. What about the underlying reasons that are like the 90% of the iceberg you never see? The reasons below the surface that makes teenagers get so hung up on marijuana in spite of what their parents say and in spite of the big risk of being busted. The world stinks. Adults keep making wars. The next world will probably kill everybody on Earth, including me. Parrots are hypocrites. They tell us one thing, but then they do another. Why don't they practice what they preach? Why are adults so hung up with making money? That's all they think about. School's a real bummer. Dull teachers, dull subjects. I just can't wait to get out. Why can't we dress the way we want in school? Sure, we're old enough to be drafted, but we're not old enough to vote. Why are they always treating us like children? Adults never have time to listen to us. And when they do, they just don't think what we're saying. If adults like to make war so much, why don't they go and fight in them? I'm better educated than either of my parents, but they don't listen to me. How can I plan for the future with the draft waiting for me? Why don't you come back some other time when everything is all right with us? And in the meantime, I'll do what I want to do here, and you do what you want to do where you live, dear. Why shouldn't I smoke grass? Why shouldn't I live now and if I don't get killed in the war or by the big bomb, all I can look forward to is making money like my father, and I know he isn't happy. You know, sometimes I think it's like a war. Everyone over 30 is the enemy. Over 30? Over 25? <laughs> Obviously, these are things that bug a lot of the young people. But this time, rather than hear from the establishment who run newspapers, radio, television, book and magazine publishing companies, political parties, and schools. Let's hear from those other teenagers who aren't smoking pot. Not all teenagers are on grass. I'm not, and my close friends aren't. I don't like to criticize anybody, but I think that too many teenagers don't have too much purpose. It's like they don't have any goals. I don't mean that they should just be planning to make money and all that, but I think that trying to find something you'll enjoy doing for the rest of your life is the least you can do now, because everybody has to work, even girls before they get married, and even after they do. I think too many teenagers traded in their idealism for a stick of weed. When I see some teenagers acting superior to those of us who don't need drugs to feel good or understand ourselves, I get real bugged. Well, now, you've heard from both sides of the question, but what you do with your life is up to you. If you become a pothead, you risk blowing the most important time of your life, your teenage, that unrepeatable time for you to grow up 
and to prepare for being an adult that can handle problems and make something meaningful out of life. Or you have the choice to have the courage to see and deal with the world for what it really is, far, far from perfect, but for you and for me, the only one there is. While it's true that some of you will actually go to the moon and perhaps other planets, it's also true that in a few short years, this world will be your establishment and you will be the establishment. A generation with the brain power and the ice world than any other generation in history. Let's hold too much criticism about what you did or didn't do because you were on pot. I've been using amphetamines for the past three years. When I was 17, I weighed 210. Now I weigh 168. I went to the doctor's office because mom thought maybe I had a, a weight problem. The doctor gave me some amphetamines, weight pills. Well, I, I, I took a few too many and, and felt groovy. So I started taking too many every day. Once you start tripping on amphetamines, you, you, you fall into a group of people where you meet all kinds of connections, especially if you'd been using something before that. To get a bigger kick faster, I started fixing crystals, methadrine. Speed gave me confidence, like I could do just about anything. You're more confident. Oh, you wouldn't do anything stupid, like jumping off a building. You just feel real, uh, uh, well, you're, your heart's beating real good. You feel like you're home, because you can rap, uh, talk, a, a lot more. Get dates much easier, too. I was losing weight rapidly. Sometimes I stayed up six or seven days. When you're up, you, you don't eat or sleep. And you get to where your mind goes blank. You don't even know what's happening. You're, you're wired. <laughs> my, my biggest trip on speed was repairing radios. I, I'd start out with one radio and then I'd have to take another radio apart to get a tube or something. And before I knew it, I had a second radio torn apart and would have to get a third radio. And I'd tear that radio apart, too. And then I'd fall asleep. By the time I'd fallen out, I'd ruined three radios. You know what to do with the first radio, but you can't do anything. Uh, a lot of people say you couldn't get hooked on crystals, but I got strung out. When I was down, you know, like, like if I lay down to go to sleep after being up about a week, I'd wake up with cramps, feeling low, and, and couldn't get out of bed. I'd have to fix in order to get up. They, they roll you physically. Your skin gets uh, discolored, and your teeth get rotten. I'd always be nervous if I didn't fix. Oh, a lot of people say it's, it's just emotional or uh, uh, psychological. But I, I did get physically dependent on them. future looks bright. Bob's mother and Mary's parents are confident too that the marriage will succeed because it's based on many things. Companionship, mutual interests, shared ambitions, and that mysterious intangible quality which we call love. And part of this love is their relationship to one another as man and woman. For Mary, good sex adjustment began when she was a very small child. Where is 
is the baby, Mommy? Why won't it come? It's right here, dear. Of course, it doesn't talk yet or cry or even eat by itself. It has to stay inside me till it's big and strong enough to be born. When it comes, Mommy, can I help to take care of it? Yes, dear. The idea of childbirth was made natural and normal for Mary. She was happy to know that she would have a new baby sister or brother. Bob's mother was a widow. In spite of this, she was determined that her son should have a proper knowledge of sex from the beginning. She answered all his questions. If no questions came, she arranged situations so that he became conscious of sex. When he was little, Bob and his mother were always together, and they had a wonderful time. As he grew older, she made sure that he played with other children, both boys and girls. And when he was older still, she was pleased and proud that he seemed to fit in well with the boys. In fact, when he was about ten, he actually scoffed at playing with girls. Mary, too, had a normal childhood, with many friends of both sexes. But as the time for Mary's first menstrual period approached, her mother explained about the changes that would take place, instead of leaving her to pick up odd bits of startling and inaccurate information from her schoolmates. Mary's father and mother got along well. They had their occasional quarrels, but in general, home life was pleasant, natural, and secure. Hi, Duchess. Hi. At about 11, Mary went through a sort of reversal. She didn't talk much and spent hours alone, just daydreaming. What's the matter with her? Oh, she's just growing up, dear. Well, hadn't you better have a talk with her? Oh, yes, dear, but I don't think this is the time. When she wants to ask questions, I'll try to be ready with the answers. Mary's mother tried to discuss sex without embarrassment and to give Mary facts without prejudice or any suggestion of fear or shame. At about 12 and a half, Mary reached puberty. Around this time, she found that her friends wanted to talk she about opened sex. opened the door and there she was lying in bed. <laughs> Some of them got most of their information from off-color jokes that they really didn't understand. But you don't always have a baby when you go over time. I read in a book that you don't have a baby. Some of them learned about sex from books. But there were so many things that they didn't know. If you um, marry your first cousin, do you have a deformed baby? Does kissing have anything to do, I mean, about having babies? Are you afraid of having a baby, Mary? No, I'm not. Because after all, people have been having babies for thousands of years. And nowadays, doctors have so many ways of making it safe. Mother says, For Mary, the fulfillment of a healthy sex life held no fears. Sex was not something sinister to be whispered about, but it was a natural function which could contribute to the ultimate happiness of home and a family. About this time, Mary developed a sudden, strong friendship with Lucille Williams. It seemed that Mary could talk better with Lucille than with anybody. They had absolutely no secrets from each other. They were inseparable. To Mary's mother, it seemed unnatural, this continual intimacy, this concentration of affection on one not very unusual girl. Oh, Lucille, wait a minute. Ethel, we forgot about Ethel. We're going to have to bring her. Oh, Ethel. we don't have to bring her. You know what she's like with boys and everything. Mary, darling, you're keeping Lucille from her dinner. Oh, I was just leaving Mrs. Gibbs. Well, bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, then. Bye. Bye. Mother forgets the devotion she had for her own girlfriend about 25 years ago. Next, there was a crush on Ethel Hampton, senior girls' tennis champion. Mary seemed to have a real need to be stirred up about someone. It was a transition stage from the antagonism toward boys just before puberty
to the next stage of falling in love with a boy. Soon she reached that stage. Their next crush was on the captain of the school football team. She spent hours trying to make herself more attractive, imagining herself in all sorts of romantic situations. It might be a boy. Hello? Oh, hello, Lucille. No, but it's going to be about a boy. John's going to ask me. He pretty nearly did today. Um, the class bell rang. Yeah. Oh, he is creamy. But it's still going to go, too. I don't know where... Bob was growing up, too. He knew about the reproductive organs and nocturnal emissions. He also knew about masturbation, but he'd read that the problem was more mental than physical. He knew that the healthiest life for him was to have plenty of exercise and fresh air. He liked football, and the coach was a hero who could do no wrong. Bob tried to be as much like him as he could. His interests were mainly masculine, and his success at sports made him sure of himself. He could take girls in his stride, just as he did games. Until one day, when Bob was 16, it became apparent that his interest in girls was getting to be more than casual. Mary and her gang were going through the hangout stage. They like to be in a crowd. When you're not sure how to act or what to say, you can hide your confusion in the general hubbub. A girl has to look as though she knew her way around, be more sophisticated than she really is. It was all new and exciting, and Mary was proud of her success. She wanted the others to see how popular she was. Hi, Mary. How about going to the dance with me Saturday night? Well, I'll think about it. Hey, wait a minute. What about me? You didn't ask me. Well, I was going to. But you didn't, though. Jim got there first. Okay, Jim. Good. See you around. A little popularity gives one self-confidence, which isn't a bad thing in moderation. I don't even know that one's name. Ellen, I'm worried about her. She's getting so silly over the boys. You should hear her on the phone. I have. But what worries me even more is the way she goes out dancing at these juke joints. She's got nothing in her head but boys, boys, boys. She's only out Friday and Saturday night. But I'm afraid she might make a little fool of herself. And I can't keep saying don't all the time. There's no use saying don't to Mary. It makes her worse. Isn't there any positive approach to this business of sex education? She knows the physical facts, but that alone doesn't give her a healthy attitude to boys. I'll have to talk more to her about how to have fun with them without being silly. Well, I guess she'll just have to learn by experience how to look after herself. And Mary was learning by experience. She acquired a lot of social skills and graces. She learned how other people are likely to react to different situations. She learned about herself. And by going with a lot of boys, she found out what kind of boy she really liked most. And her mother tried to help her develop sound judgment about boys, not to be influenced by superficial glamour or the opinions of others. Because her mother never seemed shocked, Mary talked freely with her. By 16 and a half, Mary had settled down to go steady with one boy, George Palmer, who was in her class at school. He wasn't her ideal, but she liked going steady because it meant that she was always sure of having a date 
and she never felt left out and unpopular. Her parents thought George was a nice boy, and they were glad to know who Mary was out with at first. But after several months, her mother began to be afraid that the affair was becoming too serious. Actually, Mary and George were at the point of breaking up anyway. George again? Yes. You've seen so much of him, Mary. But I've told you, he's just a date. Can I have dates if boys want to take me out? Boy, yes. But is it always going to be George? It could get to be that way, you know. And I just don't think George is the one for you. Okay, Mother, if that's the way you feel about it, I won't see him anymore. Now, will you please leave me alone? When a girl loses a steady, it takes a little while to get back in circulation. But if you want to meet boys, you go where boys are. Mary had a cheerful disposition. She was intelligent, healthy, and attractive, and she had no trouble making friends. Jack Arnold was one of the gang she had known for years. He suddenly became interested, and interesting. It seemed for a while to be romance with a capital R. Don't act like an iceberg all your life. Look, we love each other, don't we? Yes, but after all... After all what? Take me home! Now Mary began to realize what her mother had meant all these years. Through her own experience, Mary was developing a sound ideal of what love should mean in her life. It was not what Jack offered. A change is coming over Bob, too. Come on, Jeannie. Time I was getting you home. Oh, why? It's early. Work, Jeannie. Work. I've got exams coming up in the morning. What a party pooper. Bob had been to plenty of wild parties. It wasn't so excitingly new anymore. And life was full of other interesting things. He had a career to think of. He began to stay at home more. This engineering stuff really takes slugging. You're going to lose out with your girlfriend. Don't worry. I won't. He still enjoyed parties. He still took out girls, a different one every week. But his perspective had changed. The desperate rush to find out all about sex was over. In his case, too, early training was taking on new meaning through personal experience. Mary had broken off with Jack, and by chance she turned up at the same party as Bob. When they met that first night, both had a pretty good idea of the kind of people they really liked. It didn't seem much different from other dates at first, but after a few weeks, both knew that it was different. Petting was not just a form of entertainment or an experiment. There was real affection and mutual respect. More and more, they found in each other the things they were looking for. Being together heightened the enjoyment of everything they did. They tried to be together all the time. They had their quarrels, mostly over jealousy. But each time, they knew from the beginning they'd make up. They both had a good sense of humor. They both enjoyed 
doing the same thing. Because of similar family and educational background, they had much the same way of looking at things. They began to know that this time, it was for keeps. They were so sure that their love was deep and spiritual, that at times a marriage ceremony seemed to be just a formality. Love seemed to be all that really mattered. But each of them knew deep down that they wanted their marriage vows to have real meaning. Bob and Mary had a healthy attitude toward one another as man and woman that was built up step by step since childhood. First, each of them learned the biological facts of sex as soon as they were able to understand them. Second, they learned about the other sex from their own experience. Thirdly, their parents tried to help them understand the real values of sex life. And finally, long after reaching physical maturity, they became emotionally independent of family apron strings. Now, they're on their own. Do you believe their parents have done the best they could to help Mary and Bob make all these adjustments? Mary and Bob, typical of our teenagers? Have they a sound background for marriage? What do you think? I'm Sal Minio, and these are teenagers. They come in all shapes and sizes and range in age from teeny boppers to 19-year-olds. But just like in the old days, teenagers have always shared one thing in common. They've always found a unique way to group self-expression. Hey, just like always, clothes have been the groovy way of really expressing yourself. And teenagers can always be counted on to do something very original and uh, very self-expressive. There's some girls who express themselves in the more simple look. Others do so in highly feminized slacks. And for hemlines, well, this may be the long and short of it. But how much short in a skirt get? Hair has always been very important. Yes, even with boys. It's been very short and even longer than a beetle's. But girls have always had a lot more ways to express themselves through their hair. Why, they could change its color completely. And they can even simplify the entire thing and just go out to a store and buy some hair in any color they like. They can curl it. They can wave it. And they can even iron it so it comes out nice and straight, uh, split ends and all. It's necessary to take a good look to see which is the girl and which is the boy. But that's not true for all boys, especially for those who are trying so desperately to prove their manhood. However, the more personal, the more individual way to prove your manhood was to play chicken. And at one time, a chicky run was considered the best way to prove manhood, dead or alive. For girls, the matter of being chicken and proving yourself as a woman is still frequently based on accepting this kind of dare from a so-called friend. Yes, even adults admit it. Growing up isn't easy, especially if you try to keep up with the dares and fads of some of your more advanced friends. 
Two of the more advanced fads have to do with drugs. So why do you want to be down when you can be up? Please just try it once, okay? Now there's a brilliant argument for you. Why, with the help of a good, kind friend, you can be turned on, make the scene, blow grass, smoke reefers, or pot joints, or Mary Janes. Uh, those are just a few of the cool, uh, groovy names for marijuana. And if grass doesn't make it for you, baby, and especially if you need to be in, well, you can always drop a cap of acid. Now that's the real stuff. Very, very cool. Very, very groovy. <laughs> now, everybody who takes it admits that there's always the risk of a bad trip, a bummer, <laughs> a freak out, even a flip out. But why be lame, baby? Give yourself a real kick. Yes, yeah, a kick in the head. <laughs> Is LSD merely another bag? <laughs> uh, another dare, another kick? Is it insight? Or insanity? What do America's leading scientists, doctors, and psychiatrists working with people taking LSD say? As we see it, the typical psychiatric ward, LSD is certainly much more than a mere fad. Right now, we have over a dozen people hospitalized because of acute symptoms resulting directly from their taking LSD. Bizarre fatal accidents and suicides have also occurred in LSD's users. Because of this, we say, that LSD is not just a fad. People are seriously disturbed, some even dead. What is LSD? How does it work? When did it all begin? It all began in a laboratory very much like this one. In 1938, Dr. Albert Hoffman in Switzerland was looking for new drugs in the treatment of migraine headaches. He had been studying substances that came from the mold that grow on rye plants. Now, it turned out that these substances were of no use in the treatment of migraine headaches, but subsequent investigation showed that they are very fascinating indeed in the changes that they produce in our mental state. It was found that these substances could produce a change in mental state closely resembling some forms of insanity, in particular, schizophrenia. However, more interest has centered on the very peculiar symptoms that the drug produces in the subject who is otherwise normal. Normal people react to LSD by seeing strange patterns of wildly moving colors. And at other times, the subject may recall with terrifying detail incidents that are long, long forgotten. time, there is often a loss of the normal cause and effect relationships of things going on in the environment. And this leads to distortion of judgment.
One ounce of LSD makes 300,000 doses. An amount of LSD the size of an aspirin tablet can make 3,000 doses. The normal dose is 100 micrograms. An experienced chemist has no difficulty in making it at home. However, we have found that this amateur stuff contains many other substances, dangerous and often deadly. The strength of this amateur stuff is always uncertain. It may contain none, or 10, or 100, or 300, or maybe 3,000 micrograms. We have produced convulsions and death in animals with large doses of LSD. I took it the first time because I was curious. Under LSD, God's not a faraway idea. He's something that, that's right inside you that you're experiencing now. I took LSD for a kick. Man, LSD is like a vitamin for the brain. I mean, to expand your mind. LSD stimulates creativity in the brain. In other words, it uh, expands your your thought processes so that you can take in more. We gave a series of 50 tests to people before and after LSD. We found that at the end of six months following their LSD taking, that they were no more creative when we measured them than they were before they took the LSD. However, their feeling, their inner feeling of subjective creativity was there. This means, perhaps, that they may have an impression of creativity, but not creativity itself. Creativity is 90% perspiration and only 10% inspiration. And LSD doesn't enhance one's desire to perspire. LSD is a, is a really groovy way to find out more about the things around you. LSD helps me understand the whole world better. LSD helps you to understand your own mind. It releases your mind to you. LSD is a way about finding out about yourself, about your own problem. While there are many things that we don't know about LSD, there are a few that we do know. And perhaps the most important one that we do know is that it is absolutely unpredictable who will have a bad experience from LSD or when they will have it. Some people have a bad experience the first time they take the drug. Others take it 30, 60, or even 100 times before their bad trip. And the bad trip, instant insanity, often a never-never land of no return. acutely disturbed. She will be in the hospital for a few weeks or a few months. The chances are that she will get well again, at least well enough to leave the ward. Whether she will ever be the same again, have the same personality, the same ambitions, the same abilities to work, to love, to get along with other people, that we won't know for a long time. Some others who take LSD will have even more tragic freakouts. And there's no way to tell which ones these will be. Many lose all contact with reality. For instance, some forget what height means. And in a turned on or euphoric state, step or attempt to fly from cliffs and high windows with real life, permanent, non-psychedelic results. Other trippers attempt to merge their beings with large, fast automobiles. It 
it's up to you. Taking LSD is much the same as playing Russian roulette. You spin the barrel with the one bullet in it, and you take a chance. Any one shot or several Maybe an exciting and harmless kick. But each time you try, the odds keep growing against you. Until, until that final kick. It's up to you. I was 17 when I started fixing stuff. I'd stayed away. There were people using all this time. Everybody was ahead of me, but I was catching up. I thought soon I'd be accepted. This is a bad feeling to have, you know, and, and heroin was a solution. It didn't bother me for a couple of years. I was always saying no, and everybody was always heckling me. I was saying no mainly because I was scared to stick the needle in my arm. One day I was over at my friend's house. Well, there were about eight of my buddies over there. I was over there sitting on the couch, uh, up on marijuana. Well, my girlfriend had gotten hooked on stuff and said that they were going to have a party. so. Later on, she fixed some stuff and asked me if I'd like to fix some, too. I said no, and they just all turned around. They made me feel rejected. So I says, yeah, and they all turned around and started smiling at me, and it made me happy. I was shaking so bad when they stuck the needle in, I didn't know what was going to happen. I had heard that this was the big thing, and I'd seen movies on it in school which don't give the right effects on it. They teach you it's, uh, it's dreamlike. It just heavily tranquilizes you. You're just comfortable. It makes your body, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It makes your mind work just the way you want it to. I felt I could do just about anything I wanted, like talk to anybody without feeling insecure. Everywhere you sit, you're just comfortable. Plus, it, it gives you more confidence than crystals. At least to me, it does. To other people, it didn't. Heroin's not a thing you usually use in groups. I've been to houses where people are lined up, ready to use an outfit. There are many things to be done to prepare the stuff. Maybe there isn't enough outfits. Maybe 15 people are in the room, around a table, yelling, hurry up, fix. Not necessarily because they're coming down, but just because they want to fix now. They got this stuff, and, and they want to fix it. Only a few times that I ever fixed stuff did I walk out of a place with any in my pocket. After that first party with H, I met a guy who could supply me with the stuff. But after a while, my habit got too big where he couldn't support me. So he introduced me to somebody higher up. 
He was about 50. I got to where the habit cost me around 60, 80 dollars a day. I had to cash checks and burglarize a supporter. When I got arrested, I was put in jail. It was there I realized I was really strung out. When I came down, I was sick. My stomach cramped up, I sweated and vomited, and you know. But the physical symptoms d didn't bother me as much as the mental effects. You're laying there by yourself and thinking about things like how it smells when it's cooking. It tends to make you weaker than you are. It, it feels like everything has been drained from your bones and, and your bones are hollow. They feel like nothing. Then you break out in a cold sweat. It bothers you because you can never get comfortable. After I was comfortable for 18 months, there was no way I could sit to be comfortable. Sex education for trainables? Is it possible? Or is it even necessary? Well, let's start with the last question first. Why necessary? Well, we must teach those with serious disabilities that hinder their learning to live as successfully as possible with other people. Now, this includes their sexual behavior. But rather than teach, which is somewhat difficult, it becomes a training situation with as much explanation as they can absorb. And is it possible? Well, through training, they will realize who they are as men and women and what is expected of them in social situations. Sex education for the trainables should be made as simple as A, B, C. A, awareness of their bodies and their feelings. B, understanding the simple mechanics of reproduction. And C, training in responsibilities and appropriate social behavior. So let's start with A. What should they learn about their bodies? As much as they can. Now the ideal situation is a one-to-one -one basis, but if this is not possible, the group should be kept very small and include only those who will pay attention. Those who teach must do some special examination of how they themselves feel about sex. Penis. Say penis. Penis. Louder. Penis. penis. Give me another word for penis. Prick. Prick. Peter. Peter. Cock. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Cock. Rod. 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 Uh, dick. Dick. Prick. We've got yeah. it. Me. What? Me? Ding dong. Ding dong. One. Two. One. <laughs> Ryan. <Wiener. laughs> Wiener. Wiener. Talking about and using sexual terminology is difficult for many people because of the guilt and embarrassment from our heritage. Okay, let's all say them, okay? Prick, Prick. Prick. Peter. Peter, Cock, Rod, Rod. Dick, Meat, Ding Dong, Juan, Wiener, 
two joints. Teachers must be able to use these words without becoming upset or they will not be able to communicate with their students. Now, let us watch a teacher in an actual session leading a discussion concerning the differences between boy and girl. Okay, we talked about some of the differences now between men and women and the jobs they do that Sandy mentioned. Yes. Okay. Um, now let's just look at the bodies. We're going to talk about the other things that make a man and a woman different. Okay? Now, what about up here? Are they the same? Not as a man. No. Okay. Nancy, do you know what a woman has up here? What are these called? Do you know a word? Does it, do you know a word for those? No. Any word? Anybody? A breast. Breast. The breast. Okay. Do you know any other words for those? Tits. Tits. Okay. Right. Okay. Everybody knows one of those two words? Yes. Do you think that's a nice thing for a woman to have? Yes. Hmm? Are you happy that you have breasts? Yes. Hmm? I yes. am. Uh, yes. Go along with that. Huh? I go along with that. You, go, you think that's a nice thing for women to have? <laughs> right. Okay. What does the man have that the woman doesn't have? Hmm? Penis. Very good. Penis. Does everyone know that word? Yes. Penis. What do you think? Do you think that's a good thing for a man to have? To I have a penis? I think. I, I think the technique right. used is drawing out rather than pumping in. The teacher refers to boy or girl as being something very special. Understanding okay. the body well, parts and functions you're considerably you're improves their self-esteem. Taking the time to answer a question directly and fully on an individual basis is an effective way of teaching. You asked a question about it, and I, I found some pictures that might, uh, that might help explain what happens. This is the male penis here, right? Okay. Now, do you know what can happen to this? In other words, it's soft at this time. It gets hard. It does get hard. Yes. Now, you had asked me how it gets hard, right? How it does get hard. Well, there's a picture of the male penis. This is the same, same man with the penis getting hard. Every man's penis can get hard at certain times. Do you ever have that happen to you? Once in a while. Yeah. Do you ever wonder about it? Yeah, I wonder about it. Yeah. Sometimes. What usually happens after it gets hard? They go to sleep at night. Yeah. Stop fix up it go in the toilet then it goes down very good you know inside the male penis there are a lot of little blood vessels in there okay. inside and these kind of swell up and that's how it gets hard and it's a very normal thing every boy goes through that every boy goes through that you realize that yeah okay all right as long as you know that Sandy we're going to talk again about the parts of your body okay, okay? And the fact that a girl has three holes between her legs. Yeah. Three. How many, Sandy? Three. Okay, now let's look at this picture. Okay? Yeah. You see that? This hole here is the hole where you make a BM. Yes. And it's called your rectum. Yes. Okay? And this hole here is the hole from which you pee when you go to the bathroom or urinate. Yes. What else would you use it for? Well, that's just used to urinate. Now it's not used to menstruate, too. No, that's another hole, and we'll talk about that, because there's three holes here. Now you show me what I showed you. Yeah. This is when you sis, and this is when you menstruate. No. This is the hole you pee from. Yes. This is the hole you make a BM from. Yes. And this hole in between the two, yes. that's called your vagina. Yes. And that's the hole from which you menstruate. Yes. Have them repeat, if possible, to show that the lesson is being understood. And then, a few days or a week later, review the exercise to check on the progress. As a first step in understanding reproduction, we need to prepare trainables for the emotional and physical changes in their bodies. Children need this information before they reach puberty. Adolescents and adults who have never had this training 
need this knowledge as a foundation. For instance, a girl with a serious learning handicap who has been introduced to the experience of menstruation will be able to accept her first period without trauma. This is what happens to me. It will happen to you. It's all right. It's part of being a woman. This communication is repeated many times so that when a girl has her first period, she will not be frightened. This is what happens to me. It will happen to you. It's all right. It's part of being a woman. Acting out the steps through the method of pantomime enables the girl to know whom to tell and how to care for herself when her period begins. Hey, Frank. How come you haven't gotten up yet? I'm waiting sticky. Oh. What, uh, when did that happen? Did it happen during the night? Or did it just happen now? Do you know? Um, no. Well, if you're sticky, maybe it was a wet dream. Do you know what a wet dream is? No. Well, you know, how old are you now? You're, you must be about, uh... The counselor shows a calm, accepting approach to this boy who has just had a wet dream. There is no scolding or recrimination. The boy is not frightened, and there is no reason for him to feel guilty. Frank, I'm sure you understand now just what happened and uh, that this is probably going to happen quite a few times more like it does to everybody else and it's quite normal, right? Mm -hmm. I think the best thing we can do now is to show you how to clean it up. Okay? Okay. okay. Now we come to a very important section, one that everyone dreads or is embarrassed by or tries to avoid completely. The simple mechanics of reproduction, or sex, or screwing, or whatever you want to call it. And this is a pillow, and the lady's lying down. Sandy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is the lady lying down on her back? Yes. Okay. And the man's lying down on top of her? Yes. Right? Okay. And they're having sex? Yes. Right? And sex is a way that a man and woman start a baby. His penis gets hard, see? Yeah. Okay, it gets hard and it sticks out from his body. Yeah. And that's when the man puts his penis, okay, yeah. into the hole that the lady has between her legs. Yeah. Okay? Now see, that's what he's doing. He's putting the penis into the hole between her legs. The girls are not confused by the introduction of different positions or moralizations. That's how the lady is pregnant. If the retardate can understand sexual intercourse, Future sessions could include related responsibilities, such as appropriate times and places, and the purpose of birth control. Many people believe that important elements of sex education are social behavior and responsibilities. Social acceptability involves being comfortable with one's own sexuality. Ricky. Ricky, I did see what you were doing. It felt good, didn't it? It's all right. We all have feelings like this sometimes. I'm just glad you're doing this in the privacy of your own room. When you're a little bit older, we'll have to talk more about these feelings and what causes them and how we can control these feelings. I'm sorry I intruded on your privacy. I'll be sure to knock next time, okay? This manner of response frees the child of guilt and assures him he is normal. It opens communication between parent and child and introduces the concept of responsibility for his behavior. Well, 
Hi. Okay. What are you making? A rabbit. That's nice. Hmm. That's nice. You you really re use nice colors. Thank you. Uh huh. And what are you making? Can you tell me what you're making? One, two. Oh, that's uh, nice. Okay, everybody's drawing a nice picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you doing, Sandy? Okay, Sandy, what are you doing? Okay, you stop and finish your picture, okay? All right? Finish your snowman. You're going to hang your picture in the art, art contest? Yes. Oh, okay. And what's that again? Snowman. Uh -huh. You want to make another one? If a trainable does not respond to verbal admonition for masturbating in front of others, she is removed from the group. This is repeated as many times as necessary until she realizes this is not acceptable social behavior. If they cannot be made to understand through this method, they may need special help. Well, here we are going out to lunch. What are you going to have for lunch, Joe? Oh, I thought I'd have... Improvisation is another method used to teach trainable social skills. Here, two people are learning how to greet each other. The same method can be used to train them how to give and take affection appropriately. Say, so since Billy's alone, do you want to invite him to have lunch with us? Mm -hmm. You do? Okay. Why don't you come along with us and have some lunch, Billy? Okay. Okay. We were going this way. Susan. What have you been doing to yourself? Working in the bank. What are you doing the bank? I'm going to take care of my cashier. I'm going to take care of my bank. Where are you going now? To lunch. Oh. Where are you going? I'm going to lunch too. You want to join me? No, thank you. Valentine, maybe? Maybe. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Sex education should also involve instructing them how to recognize and avoid sexual exploitation. Trainables are particularly vulnerable because of common characteristics of trust, lack of judgment, and desire for affection. These individuals must be trained and exposed to well-supervised social situations in order to relate to both sexes. Can you teach values or sexual morality to a trainable? If you don't teach them, there's always the chance that they'll get in trouble and they can be arrested. Teachers should not thrust their own moral values on their students. There are too many conflicting moral systems today. This is the responsibility of the family, if available. However, it is the teacher's duty to enlighten their students on the commonly accepted standards of sexual behavior. No one should use the body of an unwilling partner for their own pleasure. Unprotected and unplanned sexual intercourse is wrong. And no one need allow anyone to touch their bodies if they do not want them to. We may not always succeed in reaching the trainables. We must always try.